Welcome everyone to another episode of Access to Perspectives Conversations. We're here today with Rico Bucher, who is a coach with her own coaching brand called Coachissima and a new program, which is um, by the title or known by the title, Your Wild Nature. Welcome, Rico. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Joe. Nice to be here with you. And for, for those of us who might see the video also to the listeners, um, in case you hear some squeaky noises, um, with us today is also Lila, a little rescue dog. So please excuse any possible interruptions. But we're here primarily and only for Rika's expertise and to share your Rika um, perspective on yeah, what, what is your wild nature about? Maybe let's start by explaining your coaching approach and, okay. and then the program that you've established, as well as um, we will also draw a line towards how this all applies to the research community at large and also any individual really, but with your particular with a scholarly community of listeners. So that's right. So I first start to explain a little bit about Cochissima. Cochissima means that it's, um, I mean, like, you know, for example, in Italian music and opera, you have fortissimo, which means that it's very loud. And Cochissima means that it's very coaching. The very coaching means to be conscious of what you are. And this is what uh, your wild nature is all about. It's a new way of being conscious about what you do. And normally we don't like some parts of us, some, some talents we have, we like them, but the other ones, we don't like them. So I like to combine both and create a, let's say creative flow out of it. And the creative flow allows you to be conscious of what you do. And so also to be conscious, conscious with others. And as you can see it in our time in politics, it's not only needed in politics, it's needed in science, it's needed in arts, it's needed in being together. Yeah, I totally agree. As we, earlier today, I was on a call with, uh, with a Russian scholar researcher discussing about the uh, crisis in Ukraine or the war actually in Ukraine. Let me continue on one thing, because what I would like to talk about with you, especially for the scientists of access to perspective, um, as it is to perspective in your name, I would like to talk uh, about the co-creation code. This is something very fresh and new in my program. And um, I think the time is ready for people to have a so-called relational intelligence. Everybody knows about emotional intelligence. Everybody knows about cognitive intelligence most scientists use it i mean in a wide range let's say but in my eyes what is needed most now is to have this kind of relational intelligence and that means i know myself i know you and we together create something new out of our relationship and this can be everybody i mean this can be your partner this can be your colleague, this can be your teammate, whatever it is, but this can also be in private. So to be conscious of what you feel, first of all, first of all about yourself, this is the start to be conscious of what the other one says and wants. And what is well known now is to talk about values, like we talked the other time, you and me together about values. Values are needed, but I think the very fundamental thing, which is underneath values and which is underneath emotions, because we talked about emotional intelligence, these are the needs we have. We have to be conscious about our needs. Otherwise, I cannot talk to nobody. I cannot understand. I mean, it's not a question of language. It's a question of emotional access to myself and to the other one. So this is why I created, let's say, this concept of co-creation code, because I think we need this code to unlock our relational intelligence. What do you think about when I tell you about it? 
it, it resonates very, very much within my own perception of how I personally like to engage with individuals around me. And I think it's also very much needed in the scientific discourse where currently in the publishing scene, like when in academic publishing, there is an increasing amount of <laughs> perception, description, <laughs> it's either or, and sometimes opposing opinions and scholars arguing, oh, my approach is the better one because ABC, rather than acknowledging uh, different viewpoints and also different results due to the experimentation approach that is chosen. And um, my personal approach with my with, with access to perspectives also to provide access to perspectives to different realities around the globe when it comes to scholarly equipment, political uh, context, historical background. So all of these are concepts, not only concepts, but realities we as human beings live by and within. And therefore, I think it's very much necessary what you propose to yeah, to develop a sense of awareness of the differences that we have as much as underlying Sim the, the, the as much as similarities not yes, only the of course yeah at the same time also kind of continuously and and always stressing the similarities and the yeah i mean what what makes us human um so not to dif uh, not to drift apart over the the differences it's I think what we are all currently also experience is, is yeah, with, with some political situations around the globe. Um, yes. I would just like ask, like what, what comes to mind as you describe this? Is this similar or related to empathy, the concept of empathy? To? To what? To the concept of empathy, being empathetic to? Yes. No, but it, it explores it much further, I would say. Mm -hmm. And I can explain it also why. Because, I mean, empathy, there are different perceptions of empathy, right? So the real empathy, I mean, the original one, let's say, that um, were explored by Daniel Goldman, for example, about the inter emotional intelligence. He first mentions 92, so 1992, always mentioned in his first book, book about emotional intelligence. He explained what empathy means. And this is the one that I lean on. So empathy means, I can feel myself, but I can also feel the other one. And as I feel the other one, I must have a sort of inner, small inner distance to be helpful to them. So I need not to dive into what the other one feels or what the other one, I mean, a problem of, of the other one or something like that, but I have to remain a little bit detached, let's say, to be able to not control the situation, but to rule the situation. And so, I mean, this definition, I like this definition of empathy because uh, it doesn't mean that you both cry, you know, that you both smile or something, but it means that I feel you. I mean, it means that I can rely to your feelings, okay? So if we turn now to the co-creation code, um, we can explore it a little bit deeper because the co-creation code starts with two people. So it's the same like empathy, but the co-creation code is much more than this. It creates something like a container with these two people like we are doing now. Right, we create this container of talking about the co-creation code. So you like to know what I mean. I like to explain to you, but in a way that you can feel it. It's not a knowledge that I want to give to you to talk about the co-creation code as a buzzword or something. I want you to feel it more. Mm -hmm. So that means that this room is an exploration room. This is much well known for scientists. I think they can rely on that very easily. So that everybody puts something in, you know, you put something in and I put something in. And we don't know yet what we will create, 
at the end of the podcast, we know what we have created. But right now, in this moment, we don't know it, no? Do we? Yeah, we have a vague idea. It's like having a research proposal or a rough plan of what it's going to be like, but you don't know what we discover in the process. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So I think for scientists, it's a very nice model uh, to, to dive in and to explore it in a personal way, first of all. You can also use it for subjects or for projects or even for project management, you can use it, but it's not so much on targets, it's more about the emotional state. And this is what, where, I mean, this is how I interpret it. Mm -hmm. And that was also how I invented that methodology. So, and uh, most recently I got, um, I don't know what you call it, a patent or it was registered as a as a logo and as a label let's say like this the procreation code and i believe that is something that we all need in future and i hope that not only scientists but also other people will try to bring their dialogues much further than just speaking mm. so container this let's say room that is created is a creative room so anything can happen there but these two must know each other better than just to say hello right right so um could you could you give an, an example or like a case study or do you want to exercise it with with me for example like just to give some some tangible examples to the listeners of what this would then look like or yeah okay so do you have something like a challenge or, or something that you work on right now and with, you don't know how to come out of it or do you have a relation that you would like to explore further or, I mean, anything like that could be. Yeah, uh, I mean, there, I have several projects that I'm currently working on where I'm not sure how they're gonna continue. Uh, choose one. Choose one. <laughs> So do you need to know the details or can we just um, generally... Exercise? I would ask you some questions about it. It's not about details in, in, the, okay. in the whole. Yeah, no, I, I can totally relate. So basically, as, as many of our listeners know already, that is that I'm working on uh, an initiative which is also evolving into its own organization. It's called Africa Archive, an uh, African-centric publishing platform. Mm -hmm. We can use that as an example. Mm -hmm. And yeah, what is, so, okay. what is the challenge? The challenge is there is basically our mission. So I'm, to, I'm working on this together with an excellent and stellar team of African scholars. And mm -hmm. I would also like to mention our partner organization, um, TCC Africa, with primarily Joy Wango, who's also part uh, or member of our co-creatives within Access to Perspectives, and we're working on on various initiatives together. Um, mm -hmm. So the vision for Africa Archive is to, to be an open access and open science portal for African scholarship and to, to change the narrative that African scholars would only, presumably would only publish so little, there's different numbers, um, um, to the global scientific discourse. But the okay. challenges are manifold, including racial biases, including publishing capacity, including equipment on the continent. So we're mitigating or we're working towards mitigating many of these challenges are now on the lookout to um, for allies and mm -hmm. supporting organizations. And, and we are finding supporting organizations um, over time. We've been doing this for three years now. And still the, the journey is difficult and um, long. And we're making progress and sometimes it's just very frustrating and challenging as many activities and initiatives are similar to many research projects so i think everybody can relate to that so yeah let's take that as an example okay let's start i, I just ask you some questions all right and you see how you can answer them so it's not much about what it is it's more related to how you do it okay so i would like to ask you what is the need that you personally follow in this project? What is your need in that? 
Okay, now that's interesting because I actually have a little bit of a continuous identity crisis being non-African myself. And there's always the danger of um, me speaking on behalf of the African scholars. And I try very much on a daily basis to avoid that notion and instead see myself as a mediator and a facilitator of dialogue with African scholars directly. And that is a balancing act that's not always easy to, to pursue. So why am I doing this? I think it's out of uh, an urge that I feel inside me for justice, to serve justice. Mm -hmm. And I've also coined a term, I haven't seen it before, but I'm sure it's a general concept by many scholars in particular, it's called global research equity. And mm -hmm. um, so um, me and, and my colleagues and, and friends are working towards that. And there's also many different, different initiatives around the globe that are um, having that as a mission of their activities. Okay. So, so yeah, my personal urge with this again is like, I think it's, yeah, I want, I want to contribute to creating justice on this planet in this lifetime. So let's pick out justice, okay? Because one, I mean, one example is more, I mean, in a singularity, we see more than in a complex version, all right? So let's take justice. What is the relationship between you and justice? Where does it come from that you have this need? Huh, okay. Well, that's opening Pandora's box. <laughs> um, yeah. Growing up, so I have many approaches to justice, also from my family story and family legacy. My great grandmother, many of my closer friends were mothers. Um, my great grandmother was fighting against the Nazi regime and gave her life. Um, quite heroically but also not so heroically because who wants to die for whatever cause but yeah so there i basically had you can say I, I have in my genes but i think it's something human beings all have in common to varying just um extents uh so yeah so that's coming from having grown up and from the family context that i've lived in but also I... Wait, 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 stop me. Um, why do you follow it now? I mean, why? You can say it's a heritage, okay? But in the same time, you are actually working on justice, as it seems to me, right? Yeah, well, yeah I was just trying to figure out why I'm so much looking for a cause in my life, because I think I want to follow in Johanna Kirchner's, like my great grandmother's uh, footsteps. I want to pay justice to her plight and her legacy and also I don't know if it's to make up for her having to die relatively early in her lifetime but I mean it's just like she, she's like a role model without me having ever met her my, my mother was four when she was killed <laughs> but okay. it was had quite a, a big impact on, on my childhood and upbringing mm -hmm. and then I had uh, I always I think I'm highly empathetic uh, as in my nature which seems to be a common trait in, I don't know, 25% of the population around the world. There's several studies with, um, I also learned about the concept of highly sensitive personalities. Um, so I've, I would cluster myself in that, um, in, in that part of the population. But, and, and with this, I always felt strongly about environmental justice, animal rights, human rights at large, and I've always, and at some point, the pressure on my shoulders and the like the weight was so hard that I didn't like it was paralyzing me. I didn't really know how to act any further in school or the studies. So I was I was trying to figure out okay, what is tangible that I can actually work on to make a change with. And then mm -hmm. I was working with indigenous people's rights, which is still I don't know, open eight percent of the global population, so it's a large number of people to support. But I felt like it's a distinct group of individuals and uh, the mission is quite precise. So it was in no sense tangible. And, and then I got an opportunity to work within that, within that uh, topic of indigenous people's rights and with indigenous peoples to go to Kenya to work with the United Nations Environment Program on a project mm -hmm. that was looking into climate change, 
and the, ri no, the rise of indigenous peoples in times of climate change. And that was in 2009 and 10. So that was actually when the whole debate of climate change had just started to take off in the media. Um, and that's how I came to Kenya. And then as a scholar myself, one thing led to the other. And now I'm working with scholars for research equity across Africa. <laughs> so that's basically the short version of a- So you followed that line. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's see. This is your personal need, mm. you're right? This is justice. It comes from your family, but you expanded it in some way so that you can work with us today. And if you would say, I mean, let's talk to the, the watchers and the participants or the, to the scientists in a wider range, do you think that for a scientist, justice is a reason to work for? No, well, I think for many it is. I, I also learned and experienced myself that research in its own, be it science like natural sciences or social sciences, in, a, in itself is, is feeding curiosity. And curiosity is something that humans have in common, like we an urge to continuously learn. And it's also what many scholars and um, would say is a duty a duty of humans throughout the lifetime to never stop learning. And being mm. a researcher as a profession allows us to do that and get paid for it. <laughs> so that's basically <laughs> also a very elite or very luxury position to be in, even though it's often um, not paid as, as well as other professions you can think of. But yeah, so I think that's what is satisfying a natural curiosity that we experience as humans. And, and I also met many young scholars who actually want to make a change with the topic that they cho chose for their studies and their research as a doctoral thesis. And it's often medical related, often it's also for environmental justice or to, to stop climate change or to help mitigate climate change or to rescue animal species um, from extinction or anything along those lines. So the motivations to becoming a researcher are manifold. And I think from my, it's just a very unscientific guess. I think around 50 or 60 percent is about curiosity. Mm -hmm. And then there is quite a large number of scholars who who feel they have a purpose with their research and want to fulfill mm -hmm. the mission that they develop for themselves. OK, so if we don't want to become too theoretical, I would like to dive into the emotional part now. So we, I mean, you told me that need, a need is unjust or in equity or diversity. Okay, so let's explore a little bit further. What are your feelings behind justice? Is it something that you feel challenged about that you mentioned curiosity, that you have the curiosity to look after this justice, to find it and to explore it further with all what you're doing, with your offers, with, with your programs and so on? Or what kind of emotions, if you look inside yourself, what kind of emotions are behind that need justice, to create justice? I think, like for me personally, it's to ease the pain that I experience when I look at the injustice that we all see in the world against mm -hmm. humans, against animals, against the environment at large. Mm -hmm. That causes a lot of pain for me, mm -hmm. like emotional pain. And, and that's paralyzing. So I want to step into action by doing something about it that I have an education in, like now scholarly research. And even though I'm not practicing biology anymore, um, but still I, I practice the scholarly approaches that I learned as a PhD student to yeah, yeah. do something about it, like something hopefully um, informative that will also empower other people in my vicinity mm -hmm. and within my reach and the reach of my colleagues where we collaborate and co-create. <laughs> Um, yeah, to inspire them to take action and activities and initiative on their own. Okay, so I think there's the goal already, right? You can stay with the pain and say, I cannot 
take it in. I cannot see it. I cannot believe it. And you stay passive. Like you said, you, you are somehow frozen when you see it. And on the other hand, you can get that as a motivation to see what can I do, not against it, but what can I create in a positive way so that justice could happen. Do I understand you right in that? Yes, exactly. And also, like through my um, scholarly education, I also appreciate, like I mentioned before, the curiosity aspect of it, like to dig deeper into a topic, to learn, to, to see different approaches you can, and viewpoints also, to balance between opinions and not condemning one or the other opinion, but really getting informed before you make your own decision and conclusions. I think mm -hmm. that's what researchers should be and also are perfectly equipped to do, um, and also journalists. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's not always like being human. We're also easily drawn to our emotions and be effective to them. But then, in the scholarly approach, we are also trained to take a step back out of the emotional mess. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, and to try and find a safe space to look at the situation from an informed viewpoint and with some distance without distancing us to ourselves too much from it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but I think that's a gradual experience that each of us needs to find a position in for themselves. It's not always, mm -hmm. there's no one, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so I, I very like uh, very, very much like this uh, kind I mean this way of perception, like you said, to explore further, to look behind the curtain, to get more information, not to choose between opinion and opinion, but to balance it out, you know, to have a big picture and not only one single detail as what is, I mean, what, what should be the opinion itself, right? So this is something I think scientists have in their hands because they explore much further than the normal human being, let's say about medicine. Nobody can know everything about one particular part of medicine, but scientists work deeper on that. But what they do is they compare the data. And I would say, and that is also something like a relational intelligence because I can relate data also to myself. Mm -hmm. If I evaluate data, I can say, how do I do it? You know, what do I look at? And uh, do I see more than one project? Do mm -hmm. I see out of the frame like, say, uh, like this, mm -hmm. right? And so there the emotional part comes in. You can take everything and make a flashback on your emotions, let's say it's like this. Mm -hmm. okay. So you are related to objects, you are related to human beings, you are related to your dog, to other animals, but you can also see what am I in this, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it depends because let's take, for example, another situation, you work with somebody different than me right now in a dialogue, it would be another, another way of creative flow, right? Because you and me, we have a special room, like say like that. I mean, this is what I call this relational space. We have a certain space in, uh, on us and you with others have another one. Mm -hmm. So this is exactly how opinions change. This is exactly how we see that different people create a different flow with us. Mm -hmm. And I think, to be more aware of this, that not every person is the same, right? Mm -hmm. Not every dialogue is the same because people are different and rely different uh, on each other. This could be a part for scientists, I think that could be interesting. Yeah, I agree. Like, yeah, there, there's various scenarios and, and um, situations. I remember when I was studying in Sweden with scholars from Spain, Russia, Ukraine, um, were incidents for, I mean, just randomly, well, it's not random, but they were actually in the same laboratory and now we're looking at the situation in politics these days. Um, yeah, and depend, China as well, and then how each of us was brought up, with also the political situations and our upbringing, and then that also brings about personal perceptions 
even and especially also in research and how we interpret research and our results and how we especially even like also when it's about something like bioscience like something where it's like, okay that's a neutral political neutral topic and yet there's always some political and geographical influence that each of us brings to the discussion which is also good i mean i'm not saying this shouldn't happen it makes us human and it acknowledges um, diversity on various levels yeah. And for me personally, it's important to be aware of that and not to condemn yeah. it, not to say, oh, this is never happening because it is, in my view. So the problem starts when somebody says, this is the truth, yeah. right? Because then you you stick to your frame in your head and you don't, don't open up to say, oh, what's on that, you know? <laughs> so to be curious and to see, what else can I can I rely on? You know, mm -hmm. so if somebody says this is the truth, I'm always very curious to know what kind of truth he mean, he or she means. Mm -hmm. you know? Okay, so we can explore that much further, but let's stick to what we have. So this interview is like a dialogue from us both, and. I was the one who was asking you the questions. You were opening up to tell about where you came from, what your family was, how you see justice in your work, how your projects are exploring right now. And so this opens up a kind of confidence to each other. Mm -hmm. you, know? you better now than before, because I have, I mean, listened to what you said. And maybe you know me a little bit better and you have confidence because I ask questions that opened you up and you feel better because you open up. Mm -hmm. You don't talk about what you always say, but you get to know yourself and also me a little bit more. Yeah, it's trust building. It's a trust building exercise, right? Right. And so and if we are in this way, this is what I call affirmative exploration. It has to be affirmative. If I say, oh, I'm not interested in your family, tell me about other things, you know, I push you down. I don't want to know about it. I, I push you back in that. And this is what two Africans often have. And I, I know that because of uh, my coaches that I have in French, and we talk a lot about this, to be pushed back because of color, to be pushed back because of what you have as a heritage, as a country or something, you know. But even, even in Berlin, even in Italy, where I'm here now, right? So um, to be affirmative means I open up myself and I want to know. I want to know you. And this space has to be an affirmative one. If I push you back, if I don't want to know, if I criticize you, we cannot create this form of energy that we have together mm. and I think critic and the so-called better view of let's say leaders in general you know who can say that they have the better view maybe somebody in the team has a very good idea and can be the one who brings everybody forward you know nobody knows Mm -hmm. So let's be open to each other, to explore each other, and to have this affirmative way of saying, yes, I want to know what you know, and I want to tell you about myself too. Mm. Yeah, I agree. That's also like it resonates again very well with our opening um, statements. Because it, it also underlines our, our, like, as humans being social animals, <laughs> like we want to get along with each Wait. other. And on the on the first on the first side, I mean, as a baby, we don't criticize anybody. We look for help. We look for nourishment. We look for the milk of the mother. We look for closeness. We we don't have that to be enemy to punch any everybody. You know, we are very open. We are vul vulnerable even in this openness, right? So, but then we learn how to behave how to limit us because we don't want to take the other one's space. 
how to criticize so I get a wider range of uh, space for myself, you know? So this is all that we have as a condition, but we have to go back to the wild nature. There we are, <laughs> to the wild nature in us to say, I'm open. Mm. I have the freedom in myself. I want to know you. I want to talk about myself. So let's start a creation together. Yeah. Um, okay. So, would you like you? We mentioned also in the beginning of this episode um, the program that you've developed, Your Wild Nature. Why such a wild name? I like the name, by the way. But how did you come up with the name, and how does what? How is the program serving the tagline, basically? Like, what is the approach with Your Wild Nature? Okay. So, how came I up with it? Um, I think that the wild nature, I mean, I was a rebel myself, right? I was a singer of a band, of a trash band in my youth at when I was 20, 21. And my parents hated me for that, right? Mm -hmm. Because I was well educated. I came from a good school and things like that. But I was a rebel. So I think we all have this little rebel in us, you know? We, we don't want to accept anything that is just pulled on us. We, we want to explore our own. No? Mm -hmm. And it came from, from a lot of coachings that I made in the last uh, 17 years, I think it is now. Uh, I saw that the people said, yes, I want to be nice, but this part of me, I don't like it. And I think we have to get back to integration of both of it. You know, mm -hmm. We have this side where we don't like ourselves and it's good to know why we are like that. And we have the other side why we are good, you know, to, I mean, why we are liked also personally by others. And this one is the good side. So good and bad goes together, like the yin and yang goes together and the moon and the sun goes together. So we all have both sides. And the integration makes you feel stronger because if you always keep that rebellion side, you give too much energy out of saying, I don't want that. I don't look at that. I avoid that, right? That goes, a, a, a major part goes into that avoidance, right? So, but if you can take that energy back into integration and say, yes, I'm like that. I have these two sides and I try to integrate them. But when I say, okay, I'm like that, I get much stronger and can react from this self-awareness that I have by integration. This is how it came. And it has three parts. We can say, I call it the coaching, the bridge, and the words. So the coaching is clear as a one-on-one -on -one coaching on any problem that could occur. Um, the bridge is meant to be the creative part in it. So to build the bridge to the other one. So that was a step already in the direction of relational intelligence, like I told you, told you. And the words is an awareness of how we describe ourselves, or how we see the world, of mm -hmm. how we put our perception into words. And you can do it in a poetical way, you can it in a musical way, you can do it in a scientific way, but if you talk in your own language, and for example, other, others don't know your buzzwords that you use normally, they cannot follow you. Mm -hmm. So to be aware of what you say and how makes part of this relational intelligence too. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting because I also, like in my trainings in scientific writing, I also sensitize scholars, they tend to write very technical and dry, what you consider as dry writing. So it sounds boring as you read it and it's difficult then also for us humans, social animals, it's difficult to consume the actual information in the, in the manuscripts. But, and therefore I encourage them to actually use stylistic approaches in, in writing and uh, like writing types and writing styles that would, you would find in poetry and novelistic uh, novels, um, which some scholars might argue, oh, this has no place in scholarly writing, but yes, it does because it serves the purpose of communication. Um, so to add words that 
not necessarily add information, but how the human brain in a certain language um, to process the information quicker because it helps us to contextualize. Yeah. And therefore, I think, uh, like you suggest, um, 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 a conscious choice of words beyond the mere um, expression of information is essential also for scholars in their science communication. And I would love to div dive deeper because that certainly is enough information and conversation for another hour. Um, so if you if you agree, I would very much like uh, like to invite you back to to this show for another episode. Yeah. No, I mean this gives me the bridge. If if you uh, allow me to say something more on this creative writing, I would like to show you a little bit where I am actually now because <laughs> the last days I developed a program for creative writing, mm -hmm. and the writing will take place as my in my second home base and my second home base is Trapani which is, is in Sicily it's one hour in the south of Palermo which is the capital of Sicily and uh, for those who are not, sorry to interrupt just for those who are not um, so familiar with European um, geographies is in Italy <laughs> it's in Italy yeah right it's it's the ball on the leg of Italy so the ball which is an island can I take you around a little bit? Can I show? Cool. Yeah. Okay. Let's. So let's come with me. Okay. So we see a little bit of a kitchen space, or it's basically a, yeah, our meeting room, and now we see yeah. rooms. So the me behind me. Right there's it's the meeting room. the balcony, room. and I could see a glimpse of the ocean. That's the Mediterranean, right? Obviously. Wow, beautiful skyline, roofs, uh, mountain range, clouds, and the ocean, and the Sicilian coastline. We're, for, for the listeners in the audio version of this episode, oh my god, and beautiful Italian architecture. Um, okay. We've put pictures of this in the show, no, not in the show notes, but in the associated blog post. So you will see some, you you can have some visual insights as well. And of course, you can also go to the record, to the video recording of this episode. Thank you so much, Rike. This is beautiful. Okay. Thank you too. I hope we can continue that. <laughs> yes, we will certainly do so. See you soon in Berlin when you're back here. Okay. And um, we'll put all the links to sign up for your program into the show notes, into the associated blog post. Very nice. And yeah, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me in that interview. And I'm looking forward to follow your line in the next one. <laughs> yeah, let's do this. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. So great. Bye.